Hi, this is Tom Stavros, and today I'd like to talk to you about ultrasound in evaluating uh, nipple discharge and intraductal papillary lesions. I think we can all agree that mammography is not very often helpful in nipple discharge. I feel that galactography is the gold standard, but in some centers, MRI galactography has replaced standard mammographic galactography. Uh, we're going to talk about ultrasound primarily because of its role in guiding ultrasound guided directional vacuum assisted biopsy, which is I think the ideal way to biopsy uh, these lesions. Now, even though I'm an advocate of galactography, I reserve it for what we consider high risk secretions. I don't use it in low risk secretions. So what's high risk and what's low risk? Well, high risk is spontaneous, unilateral, single duct orifice, and the nature of the discharge is clear, serous, serosanguinous, or frankly bloody. Uh, they're more likely to be cancer or, or uh, papillomas associated with this kind of discharge. Low-risk secretions are expressible only bilateral from multiple duct orifices, and the nature of the discharge is usually greenish or milky. These are usually associated with ductectasia and or fibrocystic change. Now, even though we uh, reserve galactography for high-risk secretions, I am willing to put the ultrasound probe on low-risk secretions because there are cases where we find papillary lesions associated with uh, duct ectasia or uh, fibrocystic change. And uh, ultrasound is cheap and there's no risk, so it's easy to apply in both, both groups. Uh, these are nice pictures from Laszlo Tabar. Uh, these are examples of the appearance of high-risk secretions, clear, serous, serosanguinous, and frankly bloody. And these are uh, low-risk secretions, greenish or milky, and again, you can see this is from multiple duct orifices. Uh, and this is comedo or cheesy discharge, which is sort of mixed. It can be seen with chronic periductal mastitis, but it can also be seen with grade 3 uh, DAB or DCIS. Now, the question is, are these secretions coming from the statue in the central piazza of Bologna high risk or low risk? And the answer is both. They're spontaneous and clear, which is both high risk, but it's bilateral and from multiple duct orifices, which is low risk. Now, we first started using ultrasound when galactography was suboptimal or failed. I've been doing galactography for over 20 years. Uh, when did this happen? Well, intermittent discharge. Uh, you know, the, the distal end of the duct is lined by squamous epithelium, and keratin plugs can intermittently obstruct the flow of discharge out of the nipple. Sometimes we were unable to get into the duct. Sometimes we got into the duct and extravasated the contrast. Sometimes the duct was so large that the contrast was so dense that it obscured small papillary lesions. And sometimes there were secretions coming from multiple duct orifices, mostly low risk, but one with high risk and we got into the wrong duct. So there are all sorts of reasons why we could use ultrasound when galactography didn't give us what we wanted. This is an example of a patient who uh, scheduled for a uh, galactogram but the day she came in, she couldn't express secretions. You can see that her duct is dilated, filled with echogenic fluid. And you can see the reason that her discharge has stopped is she's developed a hypercoic keratin plug within the nipple. Um, and it's obstructing the duct so the secretions can't come out. The papillary lesion is still secreting, but the secretions can't come out of the nipple uh, orifice because the keratin plug is obstructing the duct. These keratin plugs are part of the reasons that we use warm washcloths and ophthalmic pilocarpine to dilate the uh, sphincter of the duct and sometimes peripheral to central massage to try to express this um, um, keratin plug so that we can proceed with galactography. Now here's an example where the galactogram failed. It did show an introductal papillary lesion showed in the upper left arrow. Um, but ultrasound showed five different papillary lesions, and these other four papillary lesions were not visible because the duct was so large, the contrast column so thick, that uh, these small papillary lesions were not visible uh, on the galactogram, but were visible on ultrasound. Now, today we schedule the patient for a combined ultrasound and galactogram. I always perform the ultrasound first, but regardless of whether the ultrasound is positive or negative, I always do the galactogram because there are weaknesses of ultrasound the galactogram can uh, fill in for. Now, if galactography shows a lesion that was missed on ultrasound, in other words, if the ultrasound was falsely negative, we leave the needle in. 
take the patient back to the ultrasound room and inject the duct with sterile saline uh, to demonstrate the lesion on ultrasound so that we can proceed with ultrasound guided uh, vacuum assisted biopsy. Uh, it can be very helpful as a learning tool to look uh, after the galactogram. So here's a case where there's an introductal papillary lesion, but there's loose stromal tissue around ducts. And uh, do I know that this isn't just loose stromal tissue around a duct? No, I don't. But after we do the galactogram and I repeat the ultrasound, I can clearly see that there's an introductal papillary lesion about um, a centimeter and a half long in the, in the peripheral part of this duct. Uh, here's another example where the ultrasound was falsely negative. We did the galactogram. It showed a tiny introductal papillary lesion. So I took the patient back in the room with the needle still in the, in the uh, nipple and injected sterile saline. And then we could clearly show a small introductal papillary lesion that we'd missed before the galactogram. And then we could proceed with ultrasound guided vacuum assisted biopsy. So, you know, anytime an ultrasound is negative and the galactogram shows something, this is very valuable because the best way to biopsy these is with ultrasound guided biopsy. Now, the literature talks about papillomas as being echogenic. Echogenic is a garbage bag term. It doesn't mean anything. To me, echogenic sort of suggests hyperechoic, but papillomas are virtually never hyperechoic unless they're micropapillae. Now, most uh, uh, papillomas are um, isoechoic or heterogeneous. This is a typical appearance of a papilloma. You can see that on the left in the radial view, it's about the same echogenicity as the surrounding uh, fat and definitely less echogenic than the periductal fibrous tissue. Uh, notice that I've shown the anti-radial view as well. It's always important you have both views uh, because you can uh, volume average periductal white fibrous tissue with black intraluminal fluid and come up with a pseudo isochoic lesion in the radial view. But if you can show an introductal papillary lesion in the anti-radial view as well as the radial view, then you can be sure it's real and not a false positive. Now, most introductal papillomas of the size that we see that cause nipple discharge are isoechoic. Larger papillomas that cause palpable lumps or mammographic abnormalities often are heterogeneous in echotexture uh, and cont contain calcifications. Uh, one of the problems with galactography is it often just shows a duct cutoff sign. So we're looking on the left, there's a duct cutoff sign. The duct is obstructed by a papillary lesion, but I don't know if this is a tiny grain of rice papilloma or with a, whether this is something that fills an entire segment. Ultrasound clearly shows that this is only nine millimeters long. It shows me that it's a short papilloma. It shows me that I can even include the entire papilloma in a half aperture or 10 millimeter aperture DVAP probe. I don't even need the full aperture. Um, now, there is a way on galactography to get contrast past this papilloma into the more peripheral part of the duct, and that's just to massage from uh, central to peripheral. And by doing that for a few minutes, many times you can actually get contrast um, peripherally beyond the papilloma and show its extent on uh, galactography as well. Now, anytime you're going to evaluate uh, the ducts for a cause for nipple discharge, you have to see the entire duct, including the part within the nipple. So we've developed a combination of three maneuvers that we call peripheral compression, two-handed compression, a rolled nipple uh, technique. It's really all combined into a single maneuver, but it allows us to roll the nipple on its side and see uh, the tissue planes within the nipple and the ducts within the nipple to exclude a so-called nipple adenoma or a papilloma that lies within the nipple. Not in all patients, but in many patients, when you do a straight anterior approach because of the thickness of the skin, the wrinkling of the skin, the trapped air bubbles and whatnot, you can get acoustic shadowing that obscures the intranipple and immediate retroreolar part of the duct. And it's possible in some patients to have as much as a centimeter and a half of the distal duct obscured uh, by shadowing. Here we can see an example of this. We can follow an ectatic duct up toward the nipple, but we can't tell what's going on in the immediate subareolar region or within the nipple from a straight anterior approach. Well, by doing the rolled nipple maneuver, we roll the nipple on its side. So this is... Um, uh, a nipple that's rolled on its side. The tip of the nipple is over on the left and there's an air bubble at the very far left. And then behind the nipple is my index finger. And we can see uh, two ducts entering the base of the nipple from the right side. But we lose them about halfway through the nipple due to volume averaging, near field volume averaging. Uh, 
Uh, this is done with a one-dimensional array probe, which is focused at about 1.5 centimeters in depth. So once we get inside five millimeters or closer to the skin than five millimeters, uh, the beam hasn't yet become focused, and so it, uh, there's a lot of volume averaging. This is the same patient, same duct, rolled nipple maneuver, using a matrix array probe, which focuses much more quickly uh, and more tightly close to the skin. And we can now follow both of these ducts all the way through the nipple to their orifice on the surface of the nipple. So we, we definitely like to combine the rolled nipple maneuver with a matrix array transducer. I would also add as a technical point that uh, harmonics is, we use that widely, it's our default setting for breast ultrasound, but harmonics does not help in the immediate near field. So we can actually see these nipples better with harmonics turned off. So I, I turn off tissue harmonics when I, I'm doing the rolled nipple maneuver and evaluating patients with nipple discharge. So let's just look at a few examples of where the rolled nipple maneuver helped us. Here's a patient with nipple discharge, anterior view of the nipple, maybe there's something inside the nipple, it probably is, but it's, it's hard to be sure. But when we do the rolled nipple maneuver, we can see that there's a long subarelar papilloma um, shown by the uh, white arrowheads, but to the right in front of IF, which is my index finger, is a small second papilloma entirely within the nipple. Now I can access, I, I can get at that subarelar papilloma with a DVAB probe, but I can't get at the uh, intranipple uh, papilloma. So this is really not a great case for DAVB. This would require bivalving in the nipple or galactoscopic uh, biopsy and or removal in order to make a diagnosis or treat the discharge. Now, here's a similar case from an anterior view. I see a subarelar papilloma between the arrowheads that I can easily get to with a directional vacuum assisted biopsy probe. Uh, but there's a question of a second papilloma shown by the arrow within the nipple. But when I do the rolled nipple maneuver, I can see that indeed there is a subarelar papilloma as I originally thought. But what might have been a second intranipple papilloma is merely nipple tissue between two ectatic ducts. So, this is an ideal case for DAVB. There is just a single subarelar papilloma accessible by DVAB, but and there's nothing inside the nipple. Now here's a patient where, uh, with two-handed compression, I can see a nipple, uh, intranipple uh, papilloma or nipple adenoma, as it's called. But you can see how much better I can demonstrate it with the roll and the nipple maneuver on both radial and anti-radial views. Clearly, this is not a DVAB case. There's no way I can get at this with a vacuum probe. This is going to require a surgical bivalving in the nipple or, or galactoscopic uh, uh, biopsy and removal. Now, when you're evaluating patients with nipple discharge, uh, ductectasia can be a cause, or there could be blood in the duct caused by a papillary lesion or DCIS, so there can be echogenic fluid within the duct. And that means that in this case, there's three things this could be. This could just be echogenic uh, fluid within the duct. It could be a long papilloma, or it could be DCIS. Now, this is where dynamic maneuvers come in. Here I'm doing a heel and toe blotment maneuver, and I'm clearly showing that these are all just echogenic secretions. So what could have been a BIRADS-4 papilloma or, or uh, in situ DCIS uh, DAB uh, lesion is shown to be a BIRADS-2 ductectasia. And here we can see on a Tabar 3D slide that this one duct contains this yellow, very thick proteinaceous fluid, but the duct immediately adjacent to it doesn't have that. So uh, echogenesis can vary from duct to duct within the breast. Um, another way of showing this, I mean, I just showed you a stored video loop with blotment maneuver. A second way to show this is by using uh, blotment maneuvers uh, with color Doppler. And here in this case, as I'm Pushing down on the duct, uh, I'm forcing the secretions posteriorly, the echogenic secretions posteriorly. They're echogenic enough to create a Doppler signal. And you can see I'm getting a red signal. When I release compression, the echogenic secretions come back toward the nipple, so I'm getting a blue signal. So by doing split screens with and without compression on a single uh, frozen image, I can uh, demonstrate the same thing that I can by storing a video loop in grayscale. Uh, I prefer the, the video loop in grayscale. Most of us can store videos now, so that's the preferred way to do it. But if you just have hard copy, this is the second way to do it. Now, the fat or the protein 
and that's what causes the echoes and the secretions, concentrated fat and or proteinaceous debris within the duct. Remember that uh, fluid in the duct can be resorbed through the duct wall. And so if ductectasia becomes chronic, whatever protein or fat and or fat that lies within that fluid cannot get resorbed through the wall, but the fluid can. So over time, the fluid tends to become thicker and more concentrated and more echogenic. Well, the echoes can be diffusely distributed throughout the duct, or they can layer anteriorly if it's fat, or posteriorly if it's debris. And that can make it very difficult to distinguish from an introductal papillary lesion. So here we have a, a fat fluid level. The fat is layered anteriorly because the patient is lying on her back. And it's very difficult to distinguish from this uh, uh, centrally located papilloma. Here we have proteinaceous debris that's fallen to the posterior part of the duct, again, because the patient is lying on her back. And it's very difficult to distinguish from this more peripherally located papilloma. And you can see again on this beautiful Tabar 3D that proteinaceous fluid can indeed layer out and create a protein level that can be difficult to distinguish on ultrasound uh, from a papillary lesion. So here's another example where dynamic maneuvers help. This is an ectatic duct. Uh, the question is, is there an expansal bilobe papilloma there? Or is this just a proteinaceous debris level in a, an extremely ectatic duct? Well, again, if I do heel and toe ballotment, I can clearly show that this is all just echogenic debris, that there's no true introductal papillary lesion. And again, a BIRADS-4 ultrasound becomes a BIRADS-2 ultrasound simply by applying dynamic maneuvers. Now, I will say that there's a situation in which we're handcuffed with all of our imaging techniques, and that's with these thick, cheesy secretions that can be due to either chronic periductal mastitis or grade 3 DCIS with comedonecrosis. Um, the fluid in chronic uh, periductal mastitis can be so echogenic that it's difficult to tell from this uh, DCIS with uh, comedonecrosis. Now, 20% of these people are chronically colonized with bacteria, and the only infections I've ever seen after uh, ultrasound-guided biopsy occurred in patients where it was exactly this differential diagnosis, chronic periductal mastitis versus comedo DCIS. And so I've learned to cover these patients with prophylactic antibiotics. I use Augmentin two days before the day of and two days after uh, the um, procedure. Now, this is a difficult problem for all of our imaging tests. In galactography, the secretions are so thick that they create a filling defect difficult to tell from papilloma or DCIS. On ultrasound, the filling defects are so thick and echogenic that, again, we have a hard time telling whether this is DCIS or um, papilloma. And on MR, there's so much intense periductal enhancement that it's difficult to tell from grade 3 DCIS. So all of the three procedures that we use to evaluate nipple discharge fail to definitively distinguish chronic periductal mastitis from grade 3 uh, DAB with comedonecrosis. And so we basically just have to biopsy these. But uh, I really do want to cover these people with antibiotics because they're the exact group that does get post-operative infection in some cases. Now, Doppler can be very helpful in, in making the distinction between inspissated secretions and a papillary lesion. Part of the histopathologic diagnosis of papillomas is a fibrovascular stalk, and even small uh, introductal papillary lesions have a vascular stalk. And if we scan with very light scan technique with no compression, um, we can usually see these small introductal uh, papilloma vascular stalks. Now, this is a case where uh, on the left with the grayscale image, this could be a long, a peripherally located papilloma, or it could just be a, a debris level. Well, when I put on color Doppler, I can see it clearly had a vascular stalk, so this was a long papilloma. So in this case, Doppler uh, upgraded the diagnosis. Now, it's possible to get um, artifactual color. Uh, these are small vascular stalks, small lesions, and so it's helpful to put pulse Doppler on this and, and make sure that you have an arterial or a venous waveform. If it's artifactual, you get a motorboat artifact where it just goes <laughs> Now, only a positive Doppler helps you when you're evaluating patients with nipple discharge. Papillomas frequently undergo hemorrhagic infarction and hyalinize, and obviously an infarcted hyalinized papilloma will not show a vascular stalk. So if you see a vascular stalk, you know for sure you're dealing with an introductal papillary lesion. If you don't see a vascular stalk on Doppler, it doesn't mean it's not a papilloma. It could still be a, a, um, 
uh, hyalinized infarcted papilloma. So as is always the case in breast ultrasound, you can believe a positive Doppler more than you can believe a negative Doppler. Now one thing I will warn you about, most of the literature on papilloma says that large duct papillomas are single most of the time. And the reason the literature says that is it's based on galactography, which only looks at one low bar duct at a time. But I can tell you with ultrasound, you see multiple large duct papillomas in different uh, segments or lobes of the duct far more often than the galactographic literature would suggest because with ultrasound, we're looking at all the low bar ducts. With uh, galactography, we're only looking at one. Now, uh, the pictures on the right are all papillomas that might present with a palpable lump or mammographic abnormality. The ones on the left, one through five, are the, the spectrum of uh, sonographic appearances of papillomas that cause nipple discharge. And they're basically in order of frequency. So number one would be the most common appearance where you see a small papilloma with fluid both central and peripheral. Uh, number two would be the second most common where you see a papilloma and you only see fluid centrally toward the nipple but nothing peripherally away from the nipple. Number three would be a long papilloma that might be longer even than a two centimeter aperture of a DVA pro uh, probe. Number four would be a long papilloma involving a couple of branches. And number five would be a longer papillary lesion involving uh, multiple branch ducts. Now, obviously papilloma is not the only etiology for nipple discharge, and even though ultrasound can be better uh, or more definitive than galactography in some uh, benign papillomas, you know, we have carcinoma, which can be in situ or invasive or a mixture of in situ and invasive. You can have papillary duct uh, hyperplasia, uh, atypical duct hyperplasia, duct dictasia, communicating cysts, hyperprolactinemia, and idiopathic for many of these things, galactography can be better um, than ultrasound, and that's why I haven't completely given up on galactography. This is an example of mixed invasive uh, uh, DAB, uh, DCIS uh, cancer. Between the thin arrows, we can see a taller than wide angular lesion with a thick echogenic halo, which is the invasive part of the lesion. Over on the right is N, which is the nipple. And in front of the white arrowhead is the DCIS part of the lesion. This patient had frank bloody discharge. Now, you might ask, can you replace mammographic galactography with MR galactography? And I, I would say maybe. I mean, uh, clearly um, MR's contrast resolution is better, but its spatial resolution is less than galactography. So we can expect galactography to have a resolution of uh, 700 to, uh, 70 to 100 microns, depending on the mammographic resolution. Whereas MR resolution is going to be somewhere in the 600 to 2,000 micron range, to, depending on whether we use submillimeter isotropic voxels or whether we're using two or three millimeter slices. Now, the important thing about MR is it's not just about spatial resolution. Um, MR may not need equal spatial resolution to galactography because let's just look at micropapillary carcinoma in situ, one of the more common malignant causes of a nipple discharge. Um, MRI's better contrast resolution can show the abnormal proteinaceous fluid within the duct lumen and its uh, dynamic contrast enhancement can show abnormal periductal vascularity, even though MR is unable to resolve the individual micropapillae. Papillae. So, you know, MR can make a definitive diagnosis of micropapillary DAB, uh, even though it, it doesn't have the resolution to show individual micropapillae. But I want to show you three examples of why I've never stopped performing galactography. Uh, case one, micropapillary DAB presenting with nipple discharge. Uh, and this shows simply that the spatial resolution of galactography is better than ultrasound, and therefore it can show micropapillae in some cases where ultrasound can't. So here's a patient with nipple discharge. The left shows the ultrasound. It looked like a small, benign <laughs> introductal papillary lesion. Um, sorry about that. Um, but when we do the galactogram, I can see that there's multiple uh, micropapillary lesions in the region where we showed the papilloma. And if we look at the circle that's deeper into the right, we can see that there's micropapillae extending way peripherally into this uh, lobe, involving essentially an entire segment, which I couldn't see with ultrasound. And it makes sense because ultrasound has two or 300 micron resolution up to 1,000 micron resolution, depending on the machine, whether or not it has spatial compounding, the depth. Uh, whereas mammography, at least the mammography we had, had 70 micron resolution. So uh, big difference in spatial resolution. Galactography can show micropapillae better than ultrasound can. And on this tabar, uh, 
um, 3D picture, you can see how tiny these micropapillae are. It's not surprising that ultrasound can't resolve them. Now, in this particular case, Doppler was helpful because even though the ultrasound findings were not suspicious, the Doppler findings were. This has far more vascularity, um, more vascular stalks than I would expect with um, a benign papilloma, and there's also periductal vascularity. So Doppler can sometimes help us here. When it's positive, again, the negative doesn't help us. Case two, micropapillary DAB, presenting as nipple discharge. Now this just shows that ultrasound does very well within a probe length of the nipple, but when you get farther uh, peripheral than a probe length into more distal or more, uh, more peripheral and smaller branch ducts, ultrasound starts to have more difficulty. So this patient presented with nipple discharge. I was easily able to show a, 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 a intraductal papillary lesion within a probe width of the nipple. 3D showed it was uh, involving branch ducts and more than two centimeters in length, which you know I'll show you later is one of our higher risk findings. Um, but the galactogram, it did show the same papillary lesion, so I'm showing that within the box now, which is what we saw in ultrasound but it showed innumerable micropapillae involving an entire lobe. I mean, just crazy. Now, when I went back after the galactogram with the needle still in and injected uh, sterile saline, then in retrospect, I could see some of the micropapillae on ultrasound and this thick MIP 3D uh, reconstruction, but I, I totally missed them. So the moral of the story is here, if you get farther than a probe width from the nipple into smaller branch ducts or deeper in the breast, ultrasound does less well than it does near the nipple within a probe width. Case three, presenting as nipple discharge, micropapillary DAB again. Again, why I still go do galactography. So a patient presented with nipple discharge. I did ultrasound. It showed uh, a couple of introductal papillary lesions. Now, Normally, I would have done a galactogram, but I had just moved to a new practice. I'd given them a list of my galactograph equipment I needed a couple months before I got there, but somehow uh, they hadn't obtained it, so I was not able to go to galactogram. So my choices were to go straight to DVAB or to do some other follow-up, so I chose to go to DVAB. But I do want to show you one thing here. This is the periductal vascularity. You know, we can see... Uh, one papilloma on the bottom image with a single red vascular stalk within it. And we can see a second papilloma in the left upper image just below and to the right of the number two, again with a single vascular stalk. But look at the tremendous amount of periductal vascularity um, in this patient. So both of these images are from this patient. Now, I'm going to show you two other patients that had confirmed benign papillomas, and notice that there's just a single vascular stalk and no periductal vascularity. So, in this particular case, the ultrasound images uh, were fairly reassuring, but again, the Doppler images were suspicious. So, positive Doppler is always going to be more valuable than negative. Again, I didn't have the galactograph equipment, didn't want to send her to surgery, didn't want, we didn't have MR then. Uh, it was a mobile MR, and it just wasn't in town that day. So, uh, I did galactography. Uh, I would have done galactography, but, but they didn't have the equipment. So I went straight to DVAB. Here's the clip. And the benign diagnosis was introductal papilloma. So, you know, those small lesions with uh, single vascular stalks were indeed benign introductal papillomas. So that was cer certainly concordant with the grayscale image, maybe discordant with the Doppler, which showed tremendous periductal vascularity. I wasn't quite comfortable, so I asked the patient to come back in six months rather than the usual one year we wait after a benign diagnosis. But two months later, she returned with a BB-sized palpable lump. At first glance, you might think it's a sebaceous cyst because it's so superficial, but if you look carefully, there's a duct coming out of it, and it's tremendously vascular. And if we do a video, we can see that that duct coming out of it uh, goes posteriorly, and then it goes into some more dilated ducts, more introductal papillary lesions, and then it folds back and goes back the other way. So it looks like, because the patient is supine, we might have a segmental duct that's just a sort of wrinkled because she's lying on her back, and this might be involving an entire segment. So when I get some other still images from uh, deeper parts of the lesion, we can see that it's tremendously vascular. There's an expansile intraductal papillary lesion. Then the second fold is 
on the left image and the third fold is on the third image. So it's, you can see that there's multiple ducts. They're beaded, they're tortuous, they're angular. Um, this really looks to me like a micropapillary DCIS or DAB. Uh, so I did a second DVAB here. Uh, you can see where my second clip is. It's deeper. And again, this points out what I told you. And over and over and over, we're going to see this. If you're within a probe width of the nipple, ultrasound does pretty well. But when you get farther away, deeper in the breast, in smaller branch ducts, ultrasound starts to have some trouble that galactography can uh, save the day on. So the diagnosis from the second biopsy was micropapillary DAB or micropapillary DCIS nuclear grade 3. So the first uh, one was benign papilloma. The second was micropapillary DAB grade 3. And the moral of the story is ultrasound does better near the nipple than it does in more peripheral and uh, smaller branch duct uh, lesions. Now here's the MR. And you can see that an entire lobe is indeed involved. Because she's hanging prone, the duct is straightened out. It's not wrinkled back and forth upon itself. Um, I like the subtraction view because you can see that uh, some of this high signal is actually just proteinaceous fluid that's subtracted out, giving us a, a negative subtraction view there. Now, I want to put the MR up next to the ultrasound and point out that because the patient is prone with hanging breast on MR, this entire segmental or low bar process straightens out. Because the patient's lying on her back with ultrasound, this duct is folded back and forth upon itself, which was part of the reason it was difficult for us to evaluate it in ultrasound. An entire lobe can be involved, but it's not all straight and linear like we see on MR. It's folded back and forth upon itself on ultrasound. Okay, so those three cases show why I haven't given up with uh, galactography, why I, I continue to do galactography. Now, what about other causes of nipple discharge other than papillum? Well, duct, ductectasia is a, a, a cause. Uh, this particular case, it's so severe, we, uh, we did a prolactin level and found out that she had uh, pituitary adenoma and hyperprolactinemia. What I, what I want to point out here is that the echogenicity of the fluid within the ducts can vary greatly. Uh, so we're going from hypoechoic to mildly hypoechoic to isoechoic to hyperechoic. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is Everybody's aware that you can get severe ductectasia with hyperprolactinemia, but it's my experience that people with hyperprolactinemia also get multiple papillomas, and it's very, very difficult. The more echogenic the fluid is and the more dilated echogenic ducts there are, the more difficult it is to exclude a papillary lesion within the ducts. And again, on this Tabar image, you can see severe ductectasia. The ducts with yellow have highly proteinaceous fluid. The ducts that are clear have much thinner, runnier fluid. So the ducts with the yellow fluid would correspond to the more echogenic ducts in ultrasound, and the, and the ducts with uh, what appear to be clear fluid on the Tabar 3D image. Um, hmm, I didn't put Tabar's name on this slide, so uh, I have to give Laszlo credit, but I forgot to do it on this slide. Sorry, Laszlo. Now, it's very important that you understand that ductectasia is a diagnosis of exclusion. There can be tremendous ductectasia associated with DCIS, uh, micropapillary DAB, or with uh, papillomas. So here's a case where the sonographer came in and said, it's just ductectasia. And I said, well, yeah, the ducts are certainly dilated, but ductectasia is a di diagnosis of exclusion. You haven't shown me the whole duct as far peripherally as you can see it. So when we went in the room and scanned, sure enough, there was a large papilloma causing the severe ductectasia. So don't be lazy with ductectasia. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to interrogate the entire lumen of the duct uh, before you come to the conclusion that ductectasia is the cause of nipple discharge. Now, in general, ductectasia is going to cause milky or usually greenish secretions, but it can cause bloody secretions if there is acute or chronic periductal mastitis. Now, the inflammation occurs one segmental or low bar duct at a time. It doesn't involve all the ducts. So if you have multiple uh, low bar or segmental lactatic ducts, only the one that's inflamed will, uh, will look different. So on the right, we can see a, an ectatic duct with a thin wall. And on ultrasound, we can see its thin wall. And then on the left, we can see what appears to be isoechoic thickening of the duct wall, which in fact is periductal plasma cell mastitis.
So what appears to be a thickened wall is actually periductal inflammation. Uh, so this is an example of how a duct can look on grayscale ultrasound when there's acute inflammation. Now, you can certainly get hyperemia with inflammation. So you can get increased vascularity with periductal mastitis or with papillary lesions. Um, the important thing is when you see a vessel with a papilloma, it's merely passing through the duct wall to feed the papilloma inside the vessel. So it tends to be oriented perpendicular to the duct wall. So on the right, you can see this red vessel is roughly perpendicular to the duct wall. It's simply passing through the duct wall to supply the benign intraductal papilloma. On the left, we see acute periductal mastitis. There's tremendous vascularity. It's not inside the duct, it's outside the duct in the periductal tissues. And because it's supplying the periductal inflammation, it's orient the orientation of the vessel tends to be parallel to the duct lumen. Now, you have to be somewhat careful because the only place that a, a vascular stalk that supplies a papilloma is going to be perpendicular to the duct wall is where it passes through the duct wall. Then as the papilloma grows down the duct toward the nipple or up the duct away from the nipple, it can drag its vascular stalk with it. So the right image is showing where the vascular stalk passes through the duct wall. The left image is showing the vascular stalk as it is being dragged toward the nipple on the left or away from the nipple on the right. Now, one thing I'd point out, we're going to talk about DVAB later, but this is a good time to talk about what to target with DVAB. I mean, you can take out a 3 centimeter fiber adenoma completely and not get a drop of blood. And you can take out a 5 millimeter papilloma and get a lot of ecchymosis and maybe even a hematoma. Um, papillomas being nearer the nipple, uh, there's just more background breast vascularity near the nipple, but papillomas themselves are very vascular, and I specifically target the vascular stalk. It's important that you understand that this papilloma is not attached to any place else. The rest of the papilloma within the duct is completely unattached. The only point of attachment is where this vascular stalk penetrates through the wall. So I specifically target that uh, with my DVAB because I know I'm going to get the whole thing in the first specimen. If I get the vascular stalk, the entire thing is just going to suck right back out of the duct like you suck a piece of spaghetti in. Now, I mentioned that <clears throat> in inflammation, the vascularity is parallel to the duct wall, but it's outside the duct wall. So on the left, we can see a parallel, long parallel vessel on this radial view that's outside the duct wall posterior to it. That's a, a periductal mastitis. I do have a vessel that's parallel in the right image, but it's inside the papilloma. That's a vascular stalk that's been dragged down the duct as the papilloma grew toward the nipple. So they're both parallel, but one is inside the duct, the papillary lesion, and one is outside the duct, the periductal mastitis. Now another potential cause for uh, nipple discharge is communicating cysts. These cysts invariably have papillary apican metaplasia, so they invariably appear complex on ultrasound. They may just have tiny excrescences like the one on the right, or they may be almost completely filled with papillary apican metaplasia as we see on the one on the left. These uh, typically have a trigger point history. Um, the discharge is often intermittent. So during certain phases of the menstrual cycle, uh, when there's more activity and more secretions, the cyst may enlarge and become tender. Um, and then when they start to drain out through the nipple with nipple discharge, the lump can get smaller and go away. Also, if you push on that cyst, you can get projectile secretions. So if you want to push on a cyst to see if it's communicating with a duct, and causing nipple discharge, put on your safety goggles because I guarantee you can hit the ceiling with these discharge. If you push on something with a large diameter and the fluid has to egress through something with a tiny diameter, there's tremendous acceleration by the Venturi principle uh, that's going to cause this thing to accelerate and, and they can get very projectile uh, discharge. Now, many times the duct communicating with the nipple is so tortuous that it's very difficult to tell whether there's communication. So one thing you can do is put a color Doppler box on part of the duct between the nipple and the cyst. And so here when I push down on the cyst, um, I get uh, secretions going one direction. And when I release uh, 
I get uh, secretions going the other direction. So again, with split screen color images, I can document that indeed this tortuous duct communicates with the cyst. Now, why do we recommend DVAB rather than core biopsy? Well, we can get a definitive diagnosis in almost all cases with DVAB. The core biopsy specimens are smaller, they're macerated, the pathologist is less likely to be satisfied and more likely to recommend surgical excision to get an adequate specimen. Uh, we know that ultrasound-guided DVAB, if you do it right, removes the large duct papilloma in the first specimen in about 90% of cases, as long as we get the fibrovascular stalk, and the specimen is much less macerated then. Uh, core biopsy rarely removes the whole lesion and, and rarely stops the discharge. Now, um, the pathologist should not recommend excisional biopsy if we've already excised the lesion with ultrasound guided directional vacuum assisted biopsy, but uh, we have to tell him that we've removed it and specifically request that uh, he serial section, he or she serial spec section the entire specimen because it's really not kosher to recommend excision when it's already been excised. Uh, the important thing is we found that uh, DVAB can stop secretions in about 90% of patients. So we don't just get a diagnosis, but we actually stop the secretions, and that's not the case with core biopsy. So here's an example of an intraortical papillary lesion with a vascular stalk. Here we're putting the probe in deep to the lesion, and now I've removed everything all the way up to the front, uh, you know, front of the duct, and I've deployed a marker. And that's just what we should always do. You have to deploy a marker because uh, if there's a tip or malignancy, you're going to have to get back to the spot for surgical excision. Now, it's important to know what the pathologist does with your specimens. And, and most pathologists take only three slices, each four microns thick, separated by 40 microns. And if you do a DVAB and you completely remove a papilloma, they might be looking at one-tenth of a percent or, you know, one percent of the lesion. And then they're going to say, introductal papillary lesion, recommend ex surgical excision. Well, that's, that's unacceptable because you've already excised the lesion. So the way we finally adapted to this, we actually changed our pathology requisition form. And we put a slot on there for percentage of lesion removed, and then a checkbox, please serial section whole specimen. And that was only partially successful, but at least it's a better form of communication that minimizes the chances of the pathologist unnecessarily recommending surgical excision of something you've already excised. Now, what we found with DVV is we got a definitive diagnosis. In all cases, we removed evidence of the lesion in 90% of the lesion and discharge stopped in the same 90%. I'm not sure whether that's because we completely removed the introductal papillary lesion, whether we interrupted its blood supply, or whether we interrupted the duct. But the bottom line is when we reviewed our uh, surgeon's uh, success rate, it was the same, 88%. And they were doing things like ligating all the subrelar ducts or uh, segmental resections. So they were doing much more extensive procedures and getting the same success rate we were getting with the DAVAB. Uh, more than 98% of the lesions were benign large duct papillomas, but we did identify a subset of papillary lesions that had 6% chance of in situ carcinoma or 7% chance of AD, ADH. So uh, what were the group that had a low enough chance that could be considered BIRADS uh, 3, less than a 2% chance of malignancy, less than or equal to 2%? Well, they were essentially the grain of rice lesions. They're typically about 5 millimeters in length, uh, the shape of a grain of rice. Uh, they're non-expansile. They don't expand the duct more than the associated degree of uh, fluid in the duct. Uh, they're less than two centimeters long. In other words, they're less less in length than the aperture of a normal DVAB probe. They don't involve branches. They don't involve TDLUs, and they don't have any extra ductal findings. Uh, we found that more than 98% of those were benign. Now, in, as a practical matter, does a patient care? If we call it BIREDS 3 or not, not if she presented with nipple discharge. She didn't care whether it's BIREDS 3 or 4. She wants a diagnosis and she wants it out. She wants the discharge to stop, so we're going to vacuum it anyway. But I will, I will talk about in the very conclusion cases where it might be helpful. Now, those are the f findings I showed you that correlate with BIREDS 3, but these are the findings that correlate with uh, a 13% chance of either DCIS or atypia. Uh, presence of extraductal song, strong suspicious findings like destruction of the duct wall or angles. Uh, presence of intraductal weak suspicious findings like microcalcs. Uh, 
expansion of the duct more than the associated degree of um, fluid dilatation, a length greater than two centimeters, again, greater than the length of a DVB aperture, uh, involvement of branch ducts or origin in the TDLUs or involvement of TDLUs because by definition these are peripheral papillomas rather than large duct papillomas. And then a Doppler finding of multiple interductal uh, vessels or periductal increased vascularity. Here's an example of uh, destruction of a duct wall and angular margin. So you can see the posterior duct wall is gone here and uh, posteriorly we see a couple of angles. It's more evident when I compress. So on the left is without compression. It's really hard to appreciate that. When I compress, I can see the angles and I can see that the posterior wall has been completely chewed through and eroded. These are all examples of uh, expansion of the duct greater than the associated degree of uh, fluid. One is an invasive papillary carcinoma, another is a mucinous carcinoma, another is a grade two carcinoma, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, and, and another one's ADH. But all of these expand the duct and they're in the high-risk category. This one has three high-risk features. It's expansile, it has microcalcifications, and it has more periductal vascularity and more vascularity internally than we would expect with a benign papilloma. These are longer than two centimeters and they involve branch ducts, and these were all uh, grade three DCISs. Again, these are a lot of Tavar pictures showing why this finding would tend to suggest a higher chance of DAB or grade 3 DCIS. Now this is a peripheral papilloma and it's easy to see that because it's in a large TDLU and it's also far from the nipple so that fits our concept of what peripheral should mean. We can see that there are three other uh, TDLUs that are much smaller closer to the nipple and we can also see that this thing is tremendously vascular, uh, much more vascularity than we'd expect with a papilloma. The literature is very clear that peripheral papillomas are much more likely to have atypia or in situ carcinoma and therefore are higher risk and should not be viewed as, as low risk ever uh, like you might in some cases view a benign large duct papilloma. Now, here's two papillomas side by side. More superficially, I have a peripheral um, papilloma involving a TDLU and more posteriorly, I have a typical large duct papilloma. Now, what I want to point out here, the nipple is high on the right on this image. Which one is closer to the nipple? The central, pa the large duct papilloma or the peripheral papilloma? The peripheral papilloma is closer to the nipple. So peripheral has nothing to do with distance from the nipple, nothing. It's entirely related to the fact that it arises in a TDLU, not in a large duct. So a large duct papilloma, by definition, uh, arises in a large duct and peripheral papilloma by definition arises in a TDLU. Now here they are without compression you can see the TDLU shape better but I want to show you is the biologic behavior of these. So here's the low risk large duct papilloma single, single vascular stalk as I told you they typically have and here's the uh, peripheral papilloma tremendous vascularity not just in the TDLU but the entire periductal area this is a combination of a benign papilloma with micropapillary DAB and you know it's been both Laszlo Tavares experience in mind that when you see this combination of benign multiple benign papillomas with um, uh, micropapillary DCIS uh, that there's often an underlying HPV uh, hopefully this goes down with the HPV vaccine So, as a practical matter, almost all patients who present with anoxious nipple discharge do not care whether the introductal papillary lesion does or does not appear to be a benign introductal papilloma, i.e. whether it appears by its 3 or not. They want it removed, and they want the nipple discharge to stop. However, we do encounter situations in which uh, assessing the risk of an introductal papillary lesion might be of value to the patient and or referring physician. The first would be an introductal papillary lesion found as an incidental lesion in a patient who isn't complaining of nipple discharge. Do you always have to biopsy it or could you maybe follow it? Well, I think if it meets BIRADS 3 criteria, maybe you could follow it, but obviously you'd have to do that uh, with informed consent. Uh, the key thing I find is multiple introductal papillary lesions that are too numerous to biopsy them all. So um, what you do is you look for the um, papillomas that are largest and or highest risk you biopsy them, 
and you follow the rest. And this is not uncommon. As I told you, with ultrasound, we find multiple papillomas far more often than the galactographic literature would have ever suggested because we see all the lobar ducts at one time, whereas a galactogram sees only one duct at a time. So multiple interductal papillomas are not, uh, they're not common, but they're not rare. So in summary, ultrasound can be effective as a first test for nipple discharge. Galactography or MR is useful when ultrasound fails. Ultrasound of the ducts uh, within the nipple and subarelar area requires special maneuvers, a combined peripheral compression, two-handed compression, and a rolled nipple maneuver. We schedule a patient for both ultrasound and galactography. We always do the ultrasound first, but regardless of the ultrasound findings, we perform, we perform the galactogram because we know that ultrasound has weaknesses for micropapillae, for lesions more distal from the nipple and in smaller branch ducts and deeper in the breast. If the galactogram is positive, we repeat the ultrasound with the galactograph guidance, in other words, leaving the galactograph needle in and injecting sterile saline while we're examining the patient with ultrasound. Why do we do that? Because ultrasound guided DAVB is the best way to biopsy these, and we need to know exactly where the lesion is and what it looks like in order to perform the ultrasound guided DVAB and, and repeating the galactogram with uh, a sterile saline in, in the ultrasound room gives us exactly that information. If the nipple is involved, uh, it's a surgical or galactoscopic problem. We can't do DVAB on an intranipple lesion, but that's part of the reason for doing the rolled nipple maneuver. Ultrasound can detect causes of discharge other than papilloma, but for some, galactography may be better, and it's, it's why we still do galactography or MR. Uh, ductic tasia requires uh, caution. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Just because you see ductectasia doesn't mean there isn't a papillary lesion there. You need to uh, interrogate the entire length of a dilated duct to make sure there's not a papillary lesion causing it. And DVAB is definitive in the diagnosis and stops secretions 90% of the time. Always deploy a marker um, when you do DVAB because if there is a tip or malignancy, you're going to have to go back. Spring-loaded core biopsy is much less often definitive and almost never stops nipple discharge. Now, it's important that if you think you've removed all imaging evidence of the intraductal papillary lesion with DVAB, you inform the pathologist that you've completely excised it and specifically request that they serial section the whole specimen before uh, recommending uh, surgical excision. Uh, recommending surgical excision of a lesion that we've already excised is a ridiculously unscientific concept. Thank you.